Hello, hello, I am Joe the Science Bro, and we are back with more science talk. Today, um, as always, I bring a researcher uh, here at the institution that I work at, and um, what we are attempting to do is we are just sharing thoughts about what re what research we're doing and how we do it. You know, we're, we're trying to get across the very simple idea that scientists are people and we just, we tend to get excited about scientific things. So, um, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Marina D'Angelo. Um, Dr. D'Angelo, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, if you could just give us a brief description, what, what it is that you do here uh, <laughs> at the institution? So I am actually a researcher and instructor, a professor. Mm -hmm. So I teach in the medical school, and then I do research, which I have been doing for uh, many years, yes. um, some version of the topic. And I am what I call myself as somewhat of an expert on what's called the extracellular matrix of mm -hmm. the cell, which uh, I've described to people as the scaffold that the cell lives on. Yeah. And it's made up of lots of proteins, and it's very dynamic. Um, and actually, it wasn't until the early 80s, uh, 1980s, that people started to, researchers started to understand that it was a dynamic and not a static yeah. scaffold. And that was right about when I entered uh, graduate school in the late 80s, and so myself was very interested in it. And um, the topics that I focus on are diseases in which that extracellular matrix has a role in the disease. Mm -hmm. um, so you can think of things like collagen. Everybody's familiar with the collagen, skin diseases, et cetera, where you have <clears throat> collagens um, that are messed up, some bone diseases like osteogenesis imperfecta. Most people are OI, probably are familiar with that. Yeah. And that's uh, uh, mutations in the collagens. Um, that have very devastating effects. Mm -hmm. um, so there are diseases like osteoarthritis, which is the one that I'm quite um, interested in, where that scaffold of the cell is broken down and over time you lose that cushion in the joints yeah. and you end up with pain, inflammation, immobility, mm -hmm. and people end up having to basically have a total knee, total hip, <clears throat> total shoulder replacement. At a certain point, it becomes degenerative in nature, doesn't it? Yes. yes. So it's really age-related. Um, mm -hmm. There can be things that speed it up, like injury, um, certain diseases, uh, metabolic diseases, um, uh, but hormonal kind of diseases. But really, it's an age-related. There's statistics that say mm -hmm. that um, over... Uh, in the whole world's population, 80% of the people over the age of 60 have at least one major joint that has osteoarthritis in Oof. it. Some people it's debilitating and some mm -hmm. people it's just a little inconvenient, right? Um, so it's a, it's a very important uh, health concern. And it is absolutely about breaking down the collagens that are needed to keep the cells in place <clears throat> and eventually losing that cushioning um, and you end up with bone on bone. Mm. Well, before we before we get into the meat and potatoes yeah. of all that, let's let's go back to to the very beginning okay. of uh, Dr. When I was born. <laughs> um, why science? Why science? That's a great question. Mm. So I have to tell you, freshman year of high school, I had a teacher um, who taught us an introduction to physical science and biology. I took the same thing. Oh my goodness! And IPS, she, yeah, yeah, IPS. She was just brilliant. I loved her. And I said, oh, this science thing is kind of cool. <laughs> and I, you know, I had always been inquisitive as a child, but I had, you know, I really liked the arts. I played music and I was a ballet dancer and I kind of thought I was going to go that way. Mm -hmm. But I really got inspired in high school. Um, and so I started to focus on science. And then it wasn't until college uh, that I realized that I liked doing experiments. So mm -hmm. I had a work study job at my university and I worked in a water quality control lab, <laughs> which is, you know, completely the other yeah. side of the universe from what I do now. But I loved that process of collecting samples and then doing something to them and keeping the notebook and finding out answers and getting mm. like excited when we would graph it and it went the way we thought it should go. Right. Um, so that's when I decided to go to graduate school and um, do research. Yeah. Wow. So <clears throat> what was it about research that really grabbed you? Um, I think for me, it's it it's a common. You know, I like to describe research in a couple different ways. Sure. 
I think research is actually a very creative process. Agreed. Science is a very creative process. You create something from nothing. Mm. So you have an idea. There's no data to support that idea. You want to test that hypothesis. So you say, like, I see this thing works this way. But what if we changed this element? What would happen? Mm -hmm. So you basically are painting a picture from scratch. So it's a doing an experiment, thinking of the experimental design, uh, bringing it to fruition in the lab is very much a creative process. Mm. And so that always attracted me. Plus, I just had this healthy curiosity about you know, how the body works, why I've always been more biology oriented. You know, mm -hmm. why is something that way? Why is a gr leaf green or, you know, why, why do my knees hurt <laughs> now that I'm old? You know, um, so I think well, I mean, that wasn't the question originally. But <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't originally. But, um, but you know, those the, that creative process, that was the first thing that really drew me to science. Mm. And then the other thing that I liked about science was that um, I'm such a Virgo, okay? <laughs> I like there to be an answer to everything. <laughs> and I felt like science, you can control the variables mm -hmm. and get a very clear response. Now, it may not be the one you were looking for, Correct. which will make it a more you know, complicated and maybe mm -hmm. even exciting uh, ven avenue to, to go on to. But you can say logically and you know think about it and control it and then get something out of it so i think that it like my my interest in having things sort of follow lockstep but also be creative about it right is what drew me towards sciences and of course in high school we had to do the little survey yeah and they said that i was it came out that i would be really good in math and science so they suggested at that time that i should be a home ec teacher <laughs> <laughs> and i said i reject that I reject it. <laughs> <laughs> I went into biology to get away from math, and here I am doing yeah. more math than I ever thought I would it's ever be true. doing. It's <laughs> true. Math is everything. We always say, my, my bandmates and I say, music is math, mm -hmm. because everything is math. Music yeah. is math. Science is math. It's all math. Well, yeah. It's like that scene from, what is it, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. <laughs> communicating by math. By math. <laughs> it's math. <laughs> so what? where did you get the current topic that you're on why why osteoarthritis right. yeah, why good copd why yeah. you know why extracellular matrix so my approach to science has always been to follow the path right so the data will tell me where to go so mm -hmm. i started out um in graduate school as a i was studying developmental biology and the lab that i was working in was actually craniofacial development palate development mm -hmm. so we were studying what happens when the palate doesn't fuse mm -hmm. uh, and it was very much extracellular matrix cell biology and some of the players in the extracellular matrix right. the soluble factors we call them things that are made by cells and move around in the extracellular matrix so I really started to build the seeds there of interest in just generally what happens with the extracellular matrix. And it was a hot topic then. Yep. So I was doing craniofacial research, and it's very hard to manipulate uh, and do craniofacial research. Um, and so when I graduated and went for my first postdoc, mm -hmm. Uh, some of the players I was interested in, uh, one is a growth factor called transforming growth factor beta. It was big and important in breast cancer mm. at that moment and the extracellular matrix of breast cancer. So I went to uh, my first postdoc and studied breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I got really deep into the collagens and what was happening with them. And so my second postdoc was in a lab that was a cartilage lab. Mm. So cartilage is that soft tissue right. on the ends of bones that, it's the, it's that the cushion. cushion. Yes. It's the exactly. shock absorber. Exactly. It's the shock absorber. So from there, being in cartilage, in a cartilage lab, that's when I started moving towards, well, what's the disease that's the most important mm -hmm. um, where the collagens are disrupted, the extracellular matrix, and that's osteoarthritis. And then uh, the COPD and periodontal disease, so general diseases of extracellular matrix, that came from following the data again. So yeah. I had 
some really interesting data at the end of my postdoc before I started my position here Mm -hmm. at this institution. And um, I couldn't figure out what was happening. So I was doing these experiments where I was looking at three different players. And um, there's something called immunoprecipitation where you use an antibody to pull a, a, a specific protein out of a sample. And I kept getting them all three coming down together. Mm. So I went to a conference. Here's a plug for why you should always talk to your colleagues. <laughs> I went to a conference and I ran into a friend from who had been in the lab that I'd been a postdoc in. Mm-hmm. And I was you know, showing the data and he said, I just started doing bioinformatics modeling. Send me the amino acid <laughs> sequences of those three players and I'm going to run models. You said the magic word. Yeah. And sure enough, they interact. It's yep. not covalent. It's a, like more of a, a an attraction. Yep. But that's why they kept coming down together. Sounds hydrophilic in a way. Yes, exactly. Either that or it's, uh, what is it, um, bipolar hydrophobia, yeah. where they're both motivated on the outward side and they're draw- pushed together. And they're together drawn to each other. And then what was interesting about it, I mean, it was very new for me. It was something that bioinformatics, I was like, ah, computers now. Um, Because when I was in undergrad, we did like a mainframe programming thing. It was pretty crazy. Um, So I was always afraid of programming. But he really worked, we worked it through together. And what we found was that there was this interaction of these three players. One was the scissors, the enzyme. Mm -hmm. One was the paper, the substrate or the collagen, and the other was the tape that was holding the paper down. And they come together in a certain way that allows the scissors to cut the paper and release it. Hmm. And so we basically discovered a region of this molecules, these are, this, these are called the metalloproteases, yeah. which is an enzyme that is like a scissor. We discovered a region that is independent of the cutting edge, but necessary for interaction with the substrate. And so we then were able to go from there. So what we found was that if the members of this family of of enzymes have this region, Mm -hmm. then we could try to target it to keep it from doing something. So then it became any disease where you have this abnormal turnover of your scaffold can be treated. And so that's when I started. Well, osteoarthritis was the lead one. Then we had an opportunity to look at periodontal disease, which is another one that people don't realize. Mm. 80% of the people over the age of 30 in the entire world have some periodontal disease. Yeah, you can't help it. It's just aging. Now, some (laughs) people are genetically predisposed to having really bad periodontal disease. And some people don't take care of their mouth, and they have really bad periodontitis. But what in the last, I guess it's been about 15 years, what's really exploded is that we've discovered that good oral health care can lead to good physical care. Meaning, if you have bad oral health care, you can have IBS, Mm. Crohn's disease, you can have heart disease that's related to it. Infl- like the inflammation yeah. starts in your mouth. So um, that's a really important disease. And from the host, meaning us, perspective, that gum tissue, mm-hmm. it starts with the bacteria, but then the gum tissue takes over and the inflammation is out of control. Well, I mean, from a certain point of view, it makes sense. I mean, uh, last last week we were talking with Dr. Balin about a major consensus paper that he was a part of. I don't know if you got the chance to read it. Um, but one of the things that he's challenging in that paper, along with his, his colleagues, is that a respiratory pathogen is getting through the nasal epithelium yep. to the brain. Yep. And I mean, you're, you're basically kind of saying the same thing. You're saying, hey, yep. this other system, I, I, I've, I've said this in previous episodes of uh, Science Talk, and that's, we think that, we used to think that all of these organ systems were their own islands, and now we find out that they're not islands. They're actually all next to each other, and they're all working with each other, and it makes sense from a certain point of view. Yep. yep. You know? And the hot topic is inflammation, and, yeah. and we just understand it better now, mm-hmm. and we realize that almost all disease begins with some level of inflammation. Right. 
And that inflammation, when it comes to the extracellular matrix, totally destroys mm-hmm. that balance yeah. of the extracellular matrix. I mean, there's another level that makes it even more interesting because normally the extracellular matrix is remodeled in mm. every, every organ in your body. There's a level at which you want to have this sort of turnover. You know, um, if you think of it as a scaffold, maybe one of the brand the, the um, rungs is rusting. So you replace it or you've lost a bolt. So you put a new bolt in. It's the same concept at yeah. the level of the cell where it's like, well, these molecules are starting to get old and they're getting nicked. So we're going to remove them and put new ones in place. That's normal. Right. You want that to happen. Right. However... When it gets out of control in an inflammatory situation in some of these diseases, mm-hmm. you want to slow that process right. and and give the body a chance to make up the distance. Mm-hmm. And in osteoarthritis, what happens is that you have this type of tissue that is degraded. Um, it, first of all, it's all the joints that weight are weight bearing, right? Mm-hmm. So sitting, standing, all those things are weight bearing joints that you use a lot, like your shoulder. So they're going to have wear and tear anyway. So they're going to be remodeling. Then it gets out of control. And eventually you lose too much of the tissue and you can't get it back. Yeah. And that's what we try to avoid. You mm-hmm. know? So that's what we're studying. That's, we're trying to look for agents to reduce that process of degradation. Well, it seems as though in the last, forgive me, maybe 20, 30 years, probably my entire lifetime, um, I, I remember as a young a younger uh, child that inflammation was like that was the disorder the disorder that needed to be treated. Oh, you've got inflammation. We're, mm-hmm. we're going to treat the we're going to give you something that'll take care of the inflammation. Right. You know, I, I can't tell you how many Bear, Aleve, Tylenol, yeah. <laughs> Advil commercials. Will just take two Aleve yeah. and it's yeah. gone all That's day. Right. Uh, Call me in the morning. Yeah, <laughs> and. Um, I, I realized more recently, probably in the last 10 to 15 years, inflammation has gone from the disorder to the signal. Yes. Um, and I, I'm, I'm reminded of my, my, my wife. At that time, she was uh, my fiance. She was having horrible inflammation, mm. and we couldn't figure out what was going on. She was showing all these different signs. At one point, her face swelled, mm. and we just couldn't figure it out. Yeah. Turns out it was her gallbladder. Oh. And her gallbladder had actually migrated up to up behind oh. her lungs. They actually thought she had a spot on her lungs. Oh my goodness! And uh, it, it's so odd just yeah. how inflammation yeah. is. It just generalized inflammation yeah. Yeah. can uh, just be the big signal. Yeah, you know? it's there was a very important uh, paper from Time is like. I can't even keep track of it anymore. Yeah, I know. And then you always have to add three years for the pandemic in mm-hmm. there. But um, I want to say it's probably 20 years ago now. Yeah. There was a paper published that showed that the cells of cartilage, which are called chondrocytes, mm-hmm. actually pr- produce inflammatory cytokines. The, yeah. The, the agents of inflammation. Yeah, the signal Which molecule. was never thought, it was it used yeah. to be thought that that just came from like the blood right. and the fluids mm-hmm. of the body where the cells that would make it would sort of migrate into the system and create the inflammation. But there, we that was discovered that there was this, this feedback. And that's really interesting because I don't know if anyone listening knows this, but cartilage is actually has no blood supply to it yeah so that's one of the reasons that when you lose when you get an injury um like a a tear in the acl or a tear Mm -hmm. in the cartilage it's very hard to fix it or children yes or children who um break their growth plate yep because the growth plate is cartilage and there's no blood flow and you know everyone knows when you hurt yourself the first thing that happens it swells it inflames the blood comes it clots it fixes itself you know and then what is the worst thing to have in the synovial fluid which is the fluid around the joint yeah it's yeah. it's the it's equal parts lubrication and shock absorbing as I yes, understand. Yes, that's right. The synovial fluid, yeah. and then the nature of the cartilage, the the cartilage that covers the bones, it actually absorbs water, and yeah. that gives it that ability to be like a shock absorber. But there's no blood there, so if you have an injury, right. you can't bring the cells to fix the injury. Mm-hmm. So that's why it's hard to treat it, osteoarthritis, because 
you don't have that natural way. Right. So giving something systemically is not necessarily going to help because it's got to get into the cartilage, that sort of thing. But that's why they thought that cartilage would not be making yeah. inflammatory cytokines, but now we know they do. Right. So that inflammation, those pathways are like endemic. Endemic. Endemic? Endemic. I never remember. <laughs> uh, to, uh, um, to all of the, the um, you know, basis of some of these, many of these diseases. So then the COPD was just another natural, because um, COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Yeah. And there's many ways that it happens, asthma's in there, etc. But one of the subsets is the pulmonary fibrosis. Mm. So what happens is the little air sacs in the lungs, alveoli. they fill the alveoli, right? They fill with air, and then when you expel, they, they recoil. Right. So there's a lot of protein called elastin yes. that's within those walls to allow it to expand and contract and then mm -hmm. expand back again. And there's little areas where the walls come together that have your regular extracellular matrix in right. it. Those are called interalveolar septa. When um, some pulmonary diseases occur, COPDs, the elastin is broken down abnormally mm -hmm. by those scissors, a different MMP, a different metalloprotease. And in response, they, the alveoli don't do what they're supposed to do. Right. And so the collagen is pulled in a different way and it starts to make more collagen. And the, when you see a scar, that's basically abnormal collagen being uh, deposited. Mm -hmm. That's called fibrosis. Mm. So pulmonary fibrosis is a subset of COPD. And it is literally the abnormal breakdown and abnormal creation of extracellular matrix in the lungs. So that's how we sort of focused on these different diseases because they all have that underlying etiology, yeah. which is breakdown is greater than uh, 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 remodeling, mm -hmm. and these m enzymes are involved. And um, so we're trying to target those enzymes in their substrate pairing or with, their, uh, with the collagens or with the uh, elastin or um, any of the proteoglycans, many different molecules in the extracellular matrix. Mm -hmm. How can we sort of block it from coming together so that we slow that process down? Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's it's funny hearing you say all of this because I I still remember, and I I, meant, I kind of mentioned this uh, last week a, a little bit, but uh, well, actually, to, to a couple of students, I remember in high school, uh, hormones did one thing, yeah. and that's it. That's yeah. all they did. Hormones did yeah. one thing, and then got you in trouble is what they did. Yeah, and then. <laughs> Um, I remember I got to college and there it was, well, you know, we found estrogen in males and uh, yeah. testosterone in females. Yeah. And it's like, okay. Uh, okay. All right. I, <laughs> that, I guess, doesn't, that doesn't I, track. I guess <laughs> that's okay. And then I remember when I, when I finished graduate school, there was a major paper that came out that basically said, hormones do a lot. <laughs> yeah, basically. <hormones laughs> no one are very hormone long, does right. only one thing. That's right. And that's it right. sounds, you know, this is one of the things that I kind of try and... Um, let a lot of people know is that scientific research is always evolving. Yes. And that's it, right. it, I don't even think evolving is the right way of yeah. characterizing it because that's not really it. It's just, it changes. Well, it's perspective. Yeah. You know, it's all about the perspective. You have a series. This is what I was saying about creating, yes. right? You know, you have a series of data and you think like, okay, what happens if we do this? And you test it mm -hmm. and sometimes mm -hmm. it opens up things you didn't never even thought were com Related, yep. like when my friend did the, my colleague and friend did the bioinformatics modeling, and suddenly we're like, what? These mm -hmm. three things work together. Um, so, you know, you're always sort of re the perspective of science changes rapidly and sometimes very, very slowly. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I love, I, I don't know um, if you ever read, it's different now, the original. Uh, DNA, the double helix yep. uh, book, um, before they became um, aware of how misogynistic it was, and they rewrote it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's funny, because genetics, it, ever since genetics was originally brought about back in, I think it was like 1870-something, it's so funny how people have used it 
for their own ends, and it ends up coming back to bite them yeah. every <laughs> single time. Well, the, the thing about the discovery of the DNA double helix mm-hmm. is that it was Watson and Crick oh, happened, story. they happened to have access to uh-huh. pieces of information just in what they were doing and labs they had visited. Yep. They got to see some things. Now, not that they weren't intelligent. I'm not no, taking that away. Them, but it was all yes, about but, perspective. Yep. They had all these pieces of data and they said, you know, Linus Pauli had the alpha helix, mm-hmm. but he didn't have the other data that they had access to. Yep. Um, and I'm just blanking on the woman's name that they totally kept out of the... Um, Rosalind Franklin. Yes, Rosalind Franklin. She that piece of data was her um, spec spec data her, her was X-ray chromatography. X-ray, yeah, was was critical mm-hmm. to them thinking about the concept the of the pin. double helix. It's right. the linchpin of their entire right. study because that's what gives them the distances. That's right. That they need to form their model, and that's even right. even then, th- there's another aspect of it is that uh, later on, their model was disproven yeah. because. That's not really how it looks under stress, right. which is really how it is in the cell. Um, and they didn't account for histone proteins as well. So, yes. Uh, but, you know, we have better modeling right. and imaging, so we can see that. Modeling, but modeling, the idea of the scientific discovery was right. that because they had a couple pieces of information that the four, the leaders in the field did not have, mm-hmm. And they had the the openness of mind to think of it differently. Yeah. Their perspective created this whole world that we never would have been able to study yeah, no. if they hadn't even suggested that. So it really is about perspective. You know, it. Par, my favorite things are paradigm shifts. Oh, and absolutely. In our lifetime, well, my lifetime, you're younger than me, but in my lifetime and part of yours, mm-hmm. we've seen a few of them. Oh, absolutely. In science. And it's really, really exciting when you think about it. Absolutely. I, I still remember as a as a young student, I was still in elementary school when um, the Genome Project officially ended in 2000. Started in 1980 and ended in 2000. Yeah. Ended in 2000. <laughs> um, and I remember my teachers in, in elementary school saying, oh, soon we'll have all the answers. Yeah, yeah. No, um, it's 2023. <laughs> as any scientist will tell you, we were left with way more questions, questions than answers. Than answers. And it was, it was nonsense data. Yeah. I, I had a, one of my professors was a young student finishing up their postdoc on human genome at the time. <laughs> and he said, no, we, we were running out of money. We had, yeah. we had nothing at the we very had to finish. end. We had to finish. We're done now. We just now. had to finish. Arbitrary. We had to write a book. Yeah, and I still exactly. remember... The image, it was very similar. It reminded me, you know what it reminded me of? You remember the Bill Gates picture where he's just filled behind all the code that makes <laughs> windows? Yeah. I still remember the image of the, the four members of the four heads of the team, and they're standing in front of the pages upon pages upon pages the of sequence. the human genome. Yeah. And I still remember this. To the, to this day, I still remember my professor going, and they knew nothing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that, I mean, that's good science. Yeah. When you end up with more questions, yep. that's good science. That Agreed. means you. That means you've uncovered the whole, right? Yep. I, I get excited when I hear about discoveries, and you know, there are many things that are not within my wheelhouse of knowledge, mm-hmm. but I still think are very cool to hear about, yeah. right? Um, but it, it always inspires me back to what I'm doing because, you, you know, when, when you discover that a planet is not a planet anymore, right? And we have, <laughs> have evidence to say why it is in our... A planetoid, or, yeah, a spheroid, exactly. a, a satellite. Right? That's right. That's right. All right. You know, I remember when, um, when the subparticles were discovered, yep. you know, I, it just shook my world, right? I was like, wow, that is so cool. I don't even understand it, but it's so cool. And it made me want to go back in the lab and like yep. rethink things. So, you know, that piece of it, science and the pursuit of questions and knowledge and trying to tease out our world, yep. I just find it very, very exciting. It's no, exciting. Uh, That's uh, the word I'm going to yeah, use. Yeah, no, uh, 100% I agree with you on that. It, it is very exciting. And um, it's almost... It's it's sad that some of the people some people out there don't seem to understand the burden that a lot of scientists get put under. Yeah. 
Um, I've, I can't tell you how many scientists, researchers that are older than me, researchers that are in their prime, and you just see them where the weight of yes. what they want to do versus what they can do yeah. crushes them. Yeah. And um, I still remember the first uh, PI I ever worked for, older gentleman, you know, never got to, you know, a, I, I pet anything while I was in there. You know, I learned from the lab manager and I still remember I walked in one day and I had I had a notebook in my hand and I was like, I have an idea. And quite literally, he just took his hands and he went like this and cleared off his desk <laughs> and he went, awesome. Let's talk. Let's talk. Yeah, yeah. And that, that was the kind of enthusiasm that yeah. I had never expected yeah. from a scientist, yeah. from a researcher. Yeah, it's very... Um, so let's talk a little bit about the politics of science, oh, right? No. What The one thing that I... In my career, because I started graduate school in the late 80s, mm-hmm. and so um, it was, uh, you know, Reaganomics time, yep. and there was a major shift in the way that uh, research was supported mm-hmm. and universities were supported, um, and it changed everything, and I don't think it's for the better, honestly, yeah. because what we now have is a situation where you're, you know, your funding is based on the sexy topic of the term of the Agreed. time, and it shouldn't be that way, right? What did I say at the very beginning of this discussion oh, well, was that you follow the data. Where's all the research on stem cells? Right, you should follow the data. Where's if the where's, data what tells was it? you um, gene therapy? Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that gene therapy is actually illegal in the United States yeah. because of three or four researchers, two of which are at Penn or were at Penn, excuse yeah, me, were. and. Uh, People don't realize that there were deaths involved. Yeah, that's right. Because of very poor science. Yeah. Um, what was it? Stem cells was a big one. And I still remember when someone... Fr- I remember when I first saw the paper on CRISPR. And everyone was like, oh, CRISPR! CRISPR's amazing! We're going to be able to do so many things. And I'm like, I'm going to wait for the longitudinal study. Yeah. I'm going to wait for that five-year study before I even remotely start thinking about yeah. adding that in. Because I remember when the first five-year study came in on stem cells, tumors, yeah, cancer, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, mutations I mean, out the wazoo. Exactly. And unfortunately, we don't just, you know, there, there's people who like to say that academia is the, the ivory tower. But, <laughs> but the thing is that, that the countries who are making the advances are mm-hmm. the ones that allow the scientists to do the science. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be a money maker. So yeah. I know I'm this I mean, is like a very we're going to spiral into a very political I and I don't mean to do that. No, you're fine. Because the point I'm the only point I'm trying to make is that you know the the advancement of science should be the the advancement no, no, no. of science. It should be the advancement of science meaning that if you have an idea and you do an experiment and it's not supported by the data then you go a different way. Yeah. It should not be like, oh, but I have yeah. to write a progress report and I won't get the next set of money. If it, You know what I mean? It shouldn't be about that. So I, I think that, I mean, I'm very lucky that I'm in an institution where I can pursue mm-hmm. the data where it takes me. Yeah. Um, not everybody has that, that luxury. But again, you know, the information is there. Um, the foibles of the human nature choose not to interpret it, but the data is there. You know, yeah. and sometimes we make the wrong decision, and you just have to say, "Okay, that oh, was absolutely. bust. Let's start again." You know? No, absolutely. I mean, that's that's one of the things that I try and teach um, some of the students that come into our labs is you have to know when to cut bait and walk away. Exactly. If you if you don't, you can get caught in this exactly. spiral That's right. that does nothing for you. You just keep And it circling. doesn't advance the science. Right. You just you keep know, circling. Right. And what you end up doing is you end up wasting funds and money and right. time and effort on a frivolous expanse. Right. People, I, you know, one of the things that we talked about in the very first episode with Dr. Balin is, is just how long a project takes it can take anywhere from two to two to seven years yeah, or to do more. a single project or more, or more. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. people people don't realize that and again like I said earlier the weight yeah. will hit you sometimes yeah. 
You're right. Absolutely. You know, we always talk about the, um, what is it, the, the starving artist or the starving writer. Well, there's such a thing as the starving scientist <laughs> who is literally ab- who's brilliant but can't yeah. get the funding. Yeah. Um, oh, I can tell you a great story oh about no. that. I have a good story about that. <laughs> so when I started graduate school, the, the one growth factor I mentioned, transforming mm-hmm. growth factor beta, it was a hot, hot topic. And now we know so much about it. It is involved in everything. Mm-hmm. It, it Depending on when the, the cell produces it and at what concentration and the timing and the, the isoform, like there's different forms of it, it's going to have totally different effects. Yep. So in the late 80s, I was a star, star starry-eyed graduate student, <laughs> and I had an opportunity because I was studying TGF-beta. Mm-hmm. Right, so actually, this was probably like right around 1990. I had an opportunity to go to this really cool um, seminar, not seminar, conference uh, at the NIH. Mm-hmm. And it was all the people, like the big names who had been involved in the the discovery of this growth factor and its importance in development of cells and tissues and organs. And um, it was small, you know, a couple hundred people. It was one of those small things where you really got to talk to folks. But my favorite, I walked away from that, my favorite presentation was a woman who probably was the age I am now, so, you know, in her, probably in her 60s, and she got up there to talk about, she was one of the seminal people for TGF Beta, and she got up there to speak, and I'm sorry, her name is escaping me right now, but she gave this beautiful presentation, (laughs) all this data, and then she said, I just went, we're at the NIH, I just want to point out, that none of this is thanks to the NIH because they have funded zero dollars of this work. So this woman who ended up with this like phenomenal groundbreaking research could not get funded because it was paradigm shifting. Right. And they just kept, you know, not funding her. So she managed to scrape the money together from yep. different places. But she said it at the NIH and I just sat there like, yes. Oh yeah. Go no, sister. No, no. There's <laughs> I can't tell you how many times, especially from the bioinformatic world, how many times we kind of end up sitting there and go, you get all of our information, you get all of our data, and you give us nothing Nothing, yeah. in the process. Yep. Because <clears throat> uh, many people don't uh, realize this. There's actually a website where all, uh, it's a repository site that is shared by two other groups that help build it, and that is NCBI, which is mm-hmm. the National Center for Bioinformatic uh information oh. but it's also shared by XBC, which is the european version and ddbj which okay. is the southeastern asian yep. version and those three will actually update each other uh-huh. regularly yes. yep and nih doesn't give us a lick for yeah. it. it it my wife uh, asked me why I get so mad about the the yeah. current writer strike that's yeah. going on, and I said because I, I understand exactly what they're going through. Yeah. I we write these articles and we get nothing for yeah, them. Yeah, you don't. Yeah. And um, you know that's that's kind of the the unsung hero aspect that we as scientists end up having, and that's we do it because one we want to answer the question, right. and two two we want to advance the science as that's you right. said. But three, and for me, this is personally, this is the most important one. I want to make it a better place. I want to leave it better. That's right. Than I than I found. I agree a hundred percent. You know, I, I mentioned this to uh, Dr. Nicholas when he when he was here. For me, it's a it's a vocation being a, a mm-hmm. researcher. Um, I just let me be at the bench. Let me be at the bench. Let me look at data. I like working with students. I like educating them. Yeah. But my my heart is in the lab personally. Right. I still do bench work. I did today. Yeah. I mean, that, for me, that, exactly, that is the exciting part. And absolutely, it's all about that, you know, writing grant proposals is just something we have to do, right? I liken it to being pregnant for nine months, because it takes Mm -hmm. about a year to write a good grant proposal, being pregnant for nine months, giving birth, Mm -hmm. and then having to give away the kid. Yep. Because you get, you do not get to keep it. No. I've written so many grant proposals in my life, and only a fraction of them have been funded. Yeah. So, you and you know, we still pursue the science. Yeah. 
but it's without funding. So mm-hmm. I, I think, I mean, there are there are folks who have been very successful at funding themselves oh, yes. fully all the time, but it's only a f- percentage oh, of yeah, all absolutely. of us doing the work. And all of that is out there. It's necessary. It's, mm-hmm. it's re- we, again, going back to that idea, it's all the little parts yep. that, that advance the science. And, you know, it is a vocation. You're absolutely correct. You do it because you love it and because you care. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's it. We don't do it for glory. There is mm-hmm. no glory, zero glory right. in being a scientist, zero. That, that's one and we the, don't get paid a lot of money. That's one of the either. paradigms that I think has shifted <laughs> uh, for the better in recent years. And that is the, the, uh, the lack of glory seeking, the lack of... Yeah trying to be that person who finishes the race first and says, I'm the one who figured it out first. I think that's going away, mostly because we're just working together more often. You have to. It's become the information, the volume of information. It's too much. It's too much. You can't be an island. You have to work with others. Well, again, Genome Project originally started with, what, six labs? And I think in its largest point, it was somewhere around 30 to 80 labs. Yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, they still didn't have enough people. Yeah. And that, that, that goes to exactly what the project was it says exactly what the scope is it was too big for one person that's right that's right (laughs) and you know that's where that's where my my degree came in you know bioinformaticians we were brought in to be the the way of taking this humongous chunk and breaking it down into maybe like a paragraph's worth of information say here's your here's your little sandwich yeah Enjoy. Enjoy. <laughs> it's a little slider. Yeah. A slider of bioinformatics. There you go. <laughs> I and I, the thing is, is that that's now turning into an umbrella term. Yeah. Bioinformatics. Yes, it is. Uh, biomed biomedical science twenty years ago is so much smaller than it is today. Yes. Uh, absolutely. Bioinformatics tomorrow is probably not even going to be half of the stuff yeah. that I learned. It's probably going to be AI and 400 yeah. other algorithms yeah. that... The whole AI you know, thing is so scary. I, you know, speaking from a computer programming standpoint, and I've had this conversation with Dr. Balin multiple times, it's not going to do half of the stuff that people think it's going to do. Yeah. And that's due to the limitations of its own programming. Right. But do you think that that'll get solved over so, time i mean programmers who know what you know can envision so and create i i lean towards isaac asimov okay on that science fiction writing isaac asimov uh he's got the tenets of ai which is ai cannot harm humankind mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. those kinds of things um he he believed and i do the same that whatever creation you make is never going to be equal to you it can't be well i agree with that a hundred percent it will always be reductive it's a reductive process i agree with you a hundred percent so if you have a program that is self-editing it can only edit what it knows i see so if it gets a rampant piece of data or a piece of data that is not as good as another it can't treat it any different than any other type I of see. data. I see. So that'll end up causing that degenerative spiral. I see. So whenever I see, like when I see Terminator and people are like, oh, it's going to be Skynet. I'm like, <laughs> no, no, it's it's not going to be Skynet. You know, I, I remember a friend of mine emailed me after Age of Ultron and he's like, oh my God, it's going to happen. I said, no, it's not. No, it's not. It's going to get into CERN and then it's going to be bogged down by the level Well, of it's data. interesting that you're saying that about the self-editing because um, a couple of friends and I were having this conversation. Uh, three of us are educators and we we're mm-hmm. having this conversation about AI yep. and um, what sort of my premise in that conversation was I don't think you can ever fully take over yeah um, just use an example of a student writing a paper yes um, yes they could write a decent paper and it'll show up uh, you know with all the points but the creativity is lost because it's the way our brains work individual brains work that we've made connections or we will make connections based on the info that we have yeah. that create new ideas and mm-hmm. 
what you just said is like it can only work with what it has right. so it can't create new ideas and I'm glad to hear that from someone who's actually a programmer right. because that was my assumption yeah. my assumption was well it's only working with what it has so um, uh, you know we in so to answer a question that somebody just brought up which was could chat GPT do massive data assessments to recognize new relationships new differences for the foundational research yes and no uh, in science, there's a relationship of two C words that we always teach students about, and that's causation and correlation. You can have correlation without causation, but you cannot have causation without correlation, and they are fundamentally related to each other. And AI can't establish causation. It can only establish correlation. So it needs an outside force to establish the causation. Right. And uh, one of the things that I constantly get asked by people is, well, what if there's a second AI that is helping edit the, yes, and then you would need another one to work on that one, and notice how it starts exponentially getting uh, larger. Another thing that is uh, limiting to them is the physical nature of computers. Mm. Uh, okay. You can only have so much load right. on an electric circuit. And yes, I understand we're starting to get into quantum computing, and uh, that's a completely different topic. But it's the best way to describe it is is that we in science we work off of line of best fit a lot. What happens if you have an outlier inside of your line of best fit? Right. What do you do? Yeah, it's an outlier. But how do you know it's an outlier? You got to. You have, more, you'd have to do a test for end. outlier. Okay, right. You'd have to do a test, test for, for outliers, outlier, yep. but you can't just treat that single point. Right. You have to do all of them. All the this points. is where I say right. the computer program would get bogged down because it would get into logical arguments with itself. Uh, so it's the adage of um, everything I'm about to say is a lie. Mm. I'm lying. Right. It, that is a logical instability right. that a computer can't rationalize. I see. Okay. So there are limitations for a computing system in in and of itself, on off, one and zero binary information. That's a limitation. So the computer can only do what you tell it to do, which is the most extremely frustrating thing to learn as a computer scientist because that means every error that you have ever encountered in your entire life on a computer your fault. is your fault. Your fault. <laughs> your fault. It is your fault. And you know, we humans will not do what we're told, so that's there, a whole other thing. <laughs> there is such a thing as programmer's rage, and if you've ever come in contact with a professional programmer who has had an issue with an error for an extended period of time, you will know. I think that I had programmer rage when I had to do Fortran programming at Drexel. Oh, God, <laughs> Fortran. See, that's another reason why um, you uh, won't get uh, Skynet. Yeah. Fortran doesn't work off of Internet. <laughs> it has no API setting for there Internet. So it, it, what that means is, is there's no module inside of it to handle that kind of... Uh, communication yeah. there has to be a physical source it's one of the reasons why we haven't gotten rid of it interesting yeah that was although it's easy to, it, the only problem is, is if you are on site it is easy to bust it yeah well <laughs> and that's because <laughs> it's it's very mathematically based yeah as you know as if I, you change it was a long time ago if you change a one to a two the thing will explode yeah and if you've never heard a computer um overload it's like popcorn. Oh, it, it's it's very frightening because it's, it's electrical happy. popcorn at happy. high voltage. Oh boy! <laughs> well, I've never had that happen. Thank God. Yes. When I was sitting in the floor of Cree Student Hall, that did not happen. To me. <laughs> I mean, uh, neural networks and AI are very interesting. Neural networks can be utilized to make weighted decisions. Mm -hmm. Now, a weighted decision is. Uh, a concept that we do as human beings all the time yeah. because a well, weighted decision is a biased decision mm -hmm. and I know that the word bias comes with its own right. but it's a different uh, type but it's, it's a different true type meaning of bias, of bias. Yes. yes so whenever you train a neural network you have a training data set and you have a uh, validation set mm -hmm. and the problem with an AI is, is that there's never going to be a large enough validation set or a large enough training set mm. 
for it to be able to handle everything all at the same time. So you'd basically have a committee of large body. It, you'd basically get humankind. It'll yeah. bog itself down. Yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So we know that so far we're hoping it's Look, not going to re- the, the, the machines aren't going to replace us. In its current form, it's our chat GPT has already been used to try and build a litigation and it's failed. Mm. It, it's already happened. Uh, there's actually a... Um, oh. It's funny you should say litigation because that's what started us on this conversation. Yep. It's, that's what we were talking about. So there is... Uh, I forget what the case is, but there's a channel on YouTube which is called Legal Eagle. And uh, he discusses a lot of legal matters. And one of the videos that he did recently was on a lawyer util- a, law- a lawyer utilizing chat GPT to build their pre-case oh, brief. Oh, interesting. Huh. Mm-hmm. Something and it did not go well. It did not because, go well. Because this is, this is the reason why I say AI is not going to re- you know grab your job anytime soon. It made up a case. Oh. It made up a case and it made up the legal reference. And they if weren't. you've listened to anyone who has asked for a journal article made by ChatGPT, it makes up the references. Oh. But how can it make up stuff when it's based on what it can When make? I say it makes up stuff, it's it's utilizing a random source generation. Oh, I see what you mean. Based okay. off of what it already knows. Got it. So okay. it's saying so it's basically building several lists. Right. And those lists generate that randomness, which Got effectively it. makes up something. Makes up, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not not you sitting there and saying, oh, I need to prove this is true, and I not remember reading these articles. That's so yeah. have you ever heard of the video game Minecraft? Yeah, of course. My son is obsessed. Ask your son how many times he's had diversions whenever he's doing something. He's got to go and he's got to, oh, I've got to go and take care of that part of the automation. Or I've got to go and do this. Right. Or I've got to do that. That's the reason why AI will never work. It'll get uh, bogged down on one of diversions. those. And then it'll spiral into uh, useless code. I like it. Think of it as you're opening up a new tab of Chrome and mm-hmm. you just keep opening them and never closing them. Never closing them, yeah. That would be the way that I search yeah. the internet. That, that <laughs> it, honestly, that's that's what ends up happening. And this is why, I, I even when people are like, but quantum computing, I'm like, yeah. that's great. But eventually, the, the program is going to outstretch its yeah. random access. And memory. I will say, I mean, just to bring it back to mm-hmm. the biology and the things that... We do a lot of primary cultures, which is cells that we take yep. from, so like um, from patients who are having total knee replacement, we'll take the biological waste, which is yep. their cartilage, and we'll plate those, put those into tissue culture, and we'll test them. Yes. They never act the same. No. Because there's variety. Yep. There's so much biological variety that you're absolutely correct. You can't. You, you, the reality mm-hmm. is not prescribed, you know, it one doesn't things, fit into a box. One of the things that I, I tell students a lot, because some of the students that we get, they come from very um, logical means, meaning they've read the, the knowledge in the book and now they're trying to apply it in real life. And I look at them and I say, this is not the textbook. Right. Practical lab work as it, the textbooks, you will not have any That's help right. from them. That's right. The theory works there. That's right. But in practice, it's something completely different. Yeah. And I always reference E. coli. And I say, what what's the gram reaction of E. coli? And they're always, oh, well, it's gram negative. Is it, though? <laughs> have you ever held E. coli at room temperature for any longer than 10 minutes? Yeah. No. It's gram variable. It'll shed its coat any time. Uh, yeah. So there you go. Yeah. Yep. And, then, and now and what it, you're going to do. That's right. No, it's true. And, y- yeah. you know, you do these, when we do replicates and we do multiple experiments, mm-hmm. always trying to build that N, yeah. that number of samples, because what you were saying about earlier, until you have enough data that you can look at the correlation, you can look at the normality of the data, mm-hmm. you can't really say. Um, you can have a beautiful isolated experiment um, yep. but when you try to put it all together then you have to really look for it try to reduce that variability I'll give you another <clears throat> one and that's um, fixation rate for mutations mm-hmm. okay has anyone ever figured out what that constant is well, I can tell you the answer is no, no. no do you know why it's because I would need all of the information from the beginning of time right 
to today. And that means every second I would need more information yep. just to calculate that one yep. constant. And you'll never have it. You'll ever. never have it. You'll never have that information. Yeah. And in a way, that's kind of the secret sauce of life is the fixation rate. Because we exist in, in different shades of gray. Yeah. And those shades are getting more muddy. Yes. As we go along. To That's right. Now, bring, we got into creativity earlier to bring color theory now into yeah. it. Yep, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Science is, science is one of those very interesting things. It's almost an entity in and of itself. Well, that's it. I, at no point can you ever say, I, I love, whenever somebody says, oh, well, we'll ask, you know, Dr. D'Angelo, she's the expert on, I'm always like, <laughs> There is no there is no such thing yep. as an expert because I know a lot yeah. about metalloproteases and extracellular matrix, but there's always going to be somebody who's going to publish something mm-hmm. that's going to make me go, oh, well, that's a whole different kettle of fish. And now I need to think about what that means, you yep. know. So, you know, science is very humbling. Yeah. Um, but also that it is, but that's what makes it so exciting and that's what makes it a career because you never are going to ever be done right you can pick a point in your life where you say okay i'm going to retire from the lab bench yeah but you're never going to be done that project the that that line of questioning you can only hope that someone's going to pick it up and continue it you know my family because i'm the first scientist in my family i'm the first one who actually went into a scientific field um, it's culture shock for them and for me whenever they discuss any kind of topic involving science. And my dad found out very quickly that he could not enter my wheelhouse <laughs> and survive. <laughs> and, you know, he was like, I, I remember he and I were having, it was the dumbest dis- discussion ever. It was about Pascal's uh, relationship, which mm-hmm. is pressure and temperature are related inversely. Mm-hmm. And I said, it's possible for you to get snow in the middle of July in 100 degree weather. Yeah. You won't live through it because you'll be crushed because of the pressure. <laughs> but it's possible. <laughs> in terms of extreme thought, it's possible. It's possible. Yeah, but you won't live through it. No. <laughs> you'll be you won't crushed be here like to talk pancake. about it. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, that's that's the beauty of science. It is it is theoretical. It is physical. It is abstract. It is concrete. It yeah. is. It's all things and yet none of it. <laughs> yep, exactly. All at the same time. All at, that's right. It's all at the same time. And again, you know, it's just the way you look at things. You, mm-hmm. know, you look at the data. It's your perspective when you're looking at the data that yeah. gives you an idea. Um, and each person will interpret differently. And so again, that that network of colleagues that you talk about your data with that is so critical to the advancement of science. I mean, uh, you know, I, I always prescribe to the the idea that anybody can do research, anybody, given, given enough time, talent, and practice and effort, anybody mm-hmm. can do the research, whether you're doing it at the bench or you're just doing it theoretically mm-hmm. from journal articles, anybody can do scientific research. And again, I, there's a reason why I, I told you that story about my first PI. And that's because at any educational level, you could get that one perspective, as you said, Mm -hmm. that changes the way you think about that same question that you've been, that's been bugging you since the beginning of your career. That's right. You know, I I thought of an experiment that uh, uh, Dr. Adams and I are working on. And he went, you know, I had a theory several years ago that is basically what you're just talking about. Exactly. And it's like, all right, let's do it. Let's, let's do let's it. Let's get right? crazy. Come and on. It changes everything. Yeah. I mean, that one uh, conversation with my colleague mm-hmm. back 20 years ago with that piece of data, he went to Bioinformatics. We created um, patents out of that. Yep. Because it, suddenly it was like, whoa, this is possible. And look at how it can work yeah. in multiple ways. It, you know, this is, this is the basis, the mm. basis of scientific inquiry is that being open to it. Again, I always tell my students that come through the lab that when you do experiments, when you have a hypothesis, um, you know, it's okay if you're wrong. Yeah. 
because that tells you a lot of information. Sometimes being wrong is better than being yes. right. Well, you know the whole concept that yeah. that you can only prove that a hypothesis is falsifiable. Yeah. You can never prove that it's true. Right. Because the end permutations mm-hmm. that you'd have to do to rule out all possibilities. Yeah. But if it's falsifiable, you're like, okay, move on. It's the statistical so, fallacy. Exactly. So that idea you know, is when you go the wrong path. But many times in my career, there have been, you know, these ideas we had, we did the experiment, and then it did something that we didn't expect. And then we go, oh, let's look at that molecule. Oh, let's look at that molecule. And suddenly we're off on this path that is way more in, in, you know, uh, um, uh, satisfying and opens so many more questions um, because that is... The, the data said, no, you mm-hmm. need to go over here. This is where we are. This is the answer over here. You know, so um, it's, yeah. No, you're right. It's exciting. I mean, we Scientists live and die by data. Yeah. And I, I truly mean that yeah. in every sense of the word. We do live and die yeah. by our data. Yeah. And you will have some researchers that will stake their entire careers on this being successful. And then it's not. And yeah. instead of taking that and going you know what let me find out why, why is it they, not they just yeah. they throw it away That's I can't right. tell you how many researchers at high institutions will just throw away a project yeah. because it wasn't what Where they thought they it thought. was yeah and yeah. it's like you, you just threw away potentially yeah. something that could lead somebody That's right. else That's down right. the rabbit hole yeah I mean and that that is that is I used to say when I was in graduate school that researchers have ca- cartoon-sized egos. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know? Because you will come across those people yeah. um, who just are like, well, if I thought it worked and it didn't, well, yep. it must be wrong. Yep. No. <laughs> you know, I don't think that's how nature works, you know. Yep. Um, I think you need to put on, take off the rose-colored glasses and get with the program. So, you know, that that there are those people that are that approach science in that way mm-hmm. and um, but the true, the true discoveries come from the ones who stick to, yeah. and you know that stick to the path. And now the data says, go here. Okay, I'm going to go here. Oh wait, now I'm going to go there. You know, and um, again, if you have the luxury yeah. to do that, because some sometimes you don't. Sometimes no, you have right. to stick to certain things, and that's it. Um, but. The most satisfying um, reads, too, are, uh, you know, you mentioned CRISPR earlier. There's a couple books by the the two Mm -hmm. folks who made CRISPR. Um, But they're really fascinating reads, Mm -hmm. just the process of science. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, one of the things that I always find interesting is is that we in science, we will never see the fruit of our labor. So true. It is is absolutely. And very rare. um, Extremely, I don't think I've. I don't think I can remember off the top of my head a a single researcher that who has made that seminal. Like take Charkoff for example. He came, he found the re- relationship between uh, cytosine and guanine. I think he was in his late sixties yeah. when he when he figured that out, and that was like the footnote in his mind of his research. And now it's the biggest one of the biggest fundamental pieces of all genetic theory today yeah and you know for him that was the tiniest little piece yeah. we won't be able to see That's the fruits right. of our labors That's and right. you know I, I tell this to my brother my brother's a catholic priest all the time you know we stand on the shoulders of giants right. and the reason why hawking used that that phrase was because we stand on the ones who That's came right. before us all that information that all that correct. information That's right you know uh, like I said, I want to leave it better than yeah. how I found it, but at the same time, I also recognize that it's part of my job to prepare the next group. That's right. You know. Well, when I was a, a graduate student, uh, my first year, we did wet labs to decide mm-hmm. where we wanted to do our research yep. uh, focus. And one of the labs I worked in was in a hemophilia lab. Mm. And this was, you know, 1987, 88. Oof. And so yeah. we were just starting uh, I, I believe 1985 was the year that the paper of polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, yep. was published. Yep. And so for my wet lab in this lab, I literally had a water bath, 
a boiling water bath and an ice bath and a timer, and I was moving the tubes between the cycles, 30 seconds a minute, 30 seconds, I was the thermocycler. (laughs) And by the time I got to my postdoc, we had thermocyclers. So, you know, there's this concept that that paper changed the way we do research. Mm -hmm. When I was in 1987, we were using P32 to do phosphorylation yes. studies. And then and then while I was a graduate student, luciferase was discovered, the, which is the chemical, if you don't know, in the uh, lightning bugs, but, yep. right? Um, and it emits bursts of light. Mm-hmm. And so it changed the way we do things. Yep. We don't, I don't use, I haven't used um, radioactivity in, since I was, uh, like a first year postdoc. I think it was like I did some S thirty five. There back are some then. people that still do uh, radioactive yeah. research just because but everything it, has changed. It's the the level of signal that radioactivity right. gives you. It gives you a higher signal. Yeah. Than fluorescence or right. absorbance does, and um, I you well I made my bones in the lab by doing Sanger sequencing. Mm-hmm. So yes. I was the thermal cycler. Yes, that's you know, right. I my 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 uh, lab notebook wasn't written in incubation times. It was written in nap times. Yeah. Nap ten minutes. <laughs> nap thirty minutes. You know. And, and While you were waiting. I still remember uh, because my my PI at the time told me this afterwards that the head of our bio department came in and it was just an open room with the Sanger bench in the back and. He couldn't figure out why the lights were on and why the, the bath was going. And the timer went off and a hand came up <laughs> from underneath, <laughs> grabbed and moved tubes, <sighs> and then yes, hit the timer. Hit the timer. And went go back, back to down. Sleep. And he went, okay. Okay, I see what's happening. <laughs> but that's the idea is that, you know, there are things that we, tools that we use, the, the way that we do, mm-hmm. the, the advances, you know, all of that needed to happen for us to be able to do quantitative oh, PCR now, you know? But, so exactly, it's just the idea that we stand on the shoulder of giants. Those biochemists came up with that idea, and it has revolutionized master the way... Master Mix. Yeah. How much, well, for for everyone at home who doesn't know what Master Mix is, it is the minimum amount of materials that you need in order to do your genetic work whether it be PCR, whether it be a, a gel that you're running, a uh, Western blot that you're doing, or anything. It's the minimum amount of all the uh, materials. You can tell the older labs that have been around during that period before, because they've got 6-liter, 10-liter, 20-liter Erlenmeyer flasks. I remember making TAE in gigantic batches and we'd throw away you know like 10 or 12 liters yeah every week because it's like nope can't use that sat out of room temperature yeah. too long yeah but you start out by making it all because yeah. you needed it and you know it just it just changes so those concepts of how we do the actual experiments mm-hmm. are also how we think about the data yeah. and you know it's the more you read the more you know and yep. the more you talk to people the more you know it's it, that's another piece of science that i like it's very yeah. people think that scientists and people who are not familiar with science think that we're like sitting in our labs by ourselves you know doing our work <laughs> But actually, it's a very um, social yeah. uh, profession mm-hmm. because, again, it's about just these ideas, like talking like we are today. Yeah. They stimulate thought and Absolutely. questions, and, and you get ideas, and you get excited, and you go and do something different. You and know, we're, we're not the, the, the people that you see in James Bond films no. where we're turning around in the captain's chair petting a cat. Where do I get my captain's chair, by the way? I've been a scientist for this many years. I know. Years. Where's my captain's chair? <laughs> I still remember, you know, when I got a lab coat with my name on it. I, I was so like, excited. oh my God, this so is exciting. awesome. Yeah. It didn't just say department. Yep. <laughs> it's a big deal. It was. Yeah. No, it's, it's just... Um, it's it's super super fun, but mm-hmm. also interesting how different. I, here's another. I love to tell stories. Can you tell? No, no. It's here's fine. another funny story about when I was a graduate student, mm-hmm. and um, I was I wanted to adopt a dog. I yeah. decided. I, so my friends knew I was looking, mm-hmm. trying to find a puppy or something that I could adopt, 
And so I was working in the lab, you know, because I was a graduate student, so I lived there. Um, you know, you're talking about those, like, the Sanger sequence. I mean, I had, I was doing assays where, you know, time points, and you, you'd sleep through the night there. You'd yep. sl- I'd lay on the ladies' room on the couch with the timer under my ear, and it would go off, and I'd get up and go do something. And, I still yeah. hear timers. In yeah, my sleep. exactly. I mean, it's just what you got to do, right? Mm-hmm. And, so, um, so I was always at the lab. So that was, and you know, this was pre-cell phone people. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So that was the number that all my friends had when they yep. wanted to tell me which bar to go to after work. Mm-hmm. It was called the called the lab for number. about ten minutes until yeah. the timer went off again, and then I had to go back. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, long story short, I was looking for this dog. I knew I wanted to get a dog, and my friend had found out that somebody had found a dog mm. um, that they could, nobody was claiming it, and it was, you know, a young dog, whatever. So he's like, oh, I know somebody. They were trying to find a place for it. Yeah. So he gave them, my phone, this woman, my phone number, and so, of course, my colleague answered the phone, Dr. Green's lab, and then they get me, and so she starts grilling me with these questions. She thought I was going to take a dog off the street and do experiments on it. Now, anyone who knows anything about the scientific method knows oh. the last thing you want is some dog off the street oh, yeah. to do uh, your experiment. Uh. But this is how people see science, right? So it's so funny. Needless to say, I did not get that dog. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I could not convince her that I was not going to vivisect the dog. Um, I but, mean, yeah. It's funny how people think scientists are with animals. Yeah. That we're we're heartless we in, love them. in our in our uh, research of them. No. People don't realize that scientists value the contributions exactly. of live animal research right. way more than what we do. Yeah. I mean, there's I, I don't know if you know this, but there's actually a, um, uh, a a statue. I believe it's in Russia that is dedicated to all the mice. Oh, that really? Were utilized. In the early days of oh, genetic research, you know, the ones that we used to bombard with, yeah. you know, yeah. megatons of, uh, yeah. of radiation. But that's that's the only way we could do it. I mean, you read it. As a scientist today, I read that and I'm like, this is barbaric. Yeah. It, you know what it reminds me of? You remember Star Trek IV? <laughs> I, I know. It, it really pulling one out yeah, there. Yeah. But you remember when McCoy is in the hospital and he, he hears the woman and he goes, what are we, in the dark ages? <laughs> And it's like, in a way... That's what it feels like when you... In a way, like yeah, yeah, it does feel like that. Because my wife and I will watch certain movies and she'll be like, is this really what it's like? And I'm like, uh, at one point, yeah, but now, no. Well, you know, it's funny because I, when we watch movies with my friends and all, my pet peeve is that whenever they show a lab, Ugh. there's Bunsen burners that are unattended. On. There's big flasks with <sighs> colorful liquids in <laughs> Like this is nothing like the lab. No. Like so. In fact, my friend was teasing me that he said, "Are you going to talk about Bunsen burners tonight?" I'm like, "Yes, I am." Probably because here we are <laughs> talking about Bunsen burners. If um, you see but, a color in your yeah, liquid, something has probably gone right. wrong. Something's not right. <laughs> um, you know. So it's just funny that, but it's that the same thing with animals. I mean, yeah. whenever uh, we we rarely do a, a animal experiments anymore because we try to get the human tissue yeah. where we can. Um, but when we would do an animal experiment, it was like, okay, what's the minimum, the absolute minimum number yep. we can get away with? And, you know, you do it and you do it. it the wor- it, Science has changed very, very much. Absolutely. Um, you know, there's all kinds of regulations and you're really careful. And like I said, you know, we People try not to do it at all. We have to follow the Geneva Convention. That's right. That's right. We There are actual, people don't realize this. The Geneva Convention was not just rules of war, but it was also, and this was post-war, so this was actually the second convention. It covers scientific experimentation. That's right. That's especially right. experimentation on human beings, and this is because my brother and I have this discussion about what, what kind of experimentation is you know, immoral, and I went, well, let me ask you this. What do you do with all the research that was generated during the Holocaust? Mm. And he looked at me, and he's like, I, I don't want to. I said, no, no. You have to now. Yeah. You have Cause to. Because otherwise those people lost their lives for Bam. no reason. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, right. it's horrific. Yes. And we never forget. But, you know, 
Do well, this, think they this would goes rather back to the, the data their point. Life for no reason. This goes back to that data point thing that yeah, we're talking with that's AI. Right. That's right. We as scientists have to treat data in a very weird way. We have to treat it both with bias and in an unbiased way simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and, and that's because we have to put the context in, but at the same time we also need to remove the context. That's right. right. And analyze it in a in a sterile way at the same right. time. Let it, the numbers truly tell you right. where they are mm -hmm. because they are pure. Yes. And not my interpretation. Well, I thought it was gonna do this. One should suit theories to facts and not facts to theories. Exactly. Exactly. That's right. That's that was my that's my biostatistician professor talking. I love that. <laughs> that's great. It's true and, though. No, you're right. I had I had PIs who had made their bones in the late seventies and they, they told me, you know, if I have to do a statistical analysis, I did something wrong. Right. And that's because they just had money. They could they could buy 50 lambs right. and be able to do research. Yeah. Ugh, yeah. You know, they could buy, and part of it is, is they would go to farms, and they yeah. would be like, I want to buy this many. And that's the right. farmer would be like, sure, I'll get you as many as I can. That's right. And that's how they would buy them. Now, yeah. you know, one mouse is, you know, probably close to $400 these days. Yeah. People don't realize... Oh, you're mistreating them. No. Do you know how expensive that mouse is? Yeah. I'm going to treat gonna that mistreat thing like that. a king. No. <laughs> no, and you're right. And and again, it's like the doing animal studies really uh, it's just like the same way we thought about the um, radiation studies. Mm -hmm. It's like the, if this is the only thing you can do at this stage or when you get to preclinical trials where you need to be sure mm -hmm. that if you're going to put this in a client-owned dog yep. or you're going to put this yep. in a human being that it's not going to kill them yep you know so then you have to do certain models to make sure but again everything is always about the the least amount you can do yep and you were talking about ethical research and how you know what do you do about that that's another really good book, The mm -hmm. Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've read that one. I've heard of it. But that's about the, uh, the basically the whole beginning of tissue culture. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, people are familiar, I'm sure, with the HeLa cell, which is used quite frequently yep. as an immortalized cell line or a cell line that just keeps growing. It never yep. has a stop to which it. Which is kind of funny when you think about it, because when we use that same definition that's how we characterize cancer cells as well. yes that's what, exactly what they did yeah that's how they discovered mm -hmm. that cancer concept yep. because that's what they were doing to the cell mm -hmm. cycle to create these immortalized cell lines but HeLa is Henrietta Lacks yep. cells um, so all those cells that you that you can find these immortalized lines that and but there's it's a very interesting book because it talks about this idea where they were taking, you know, this is biological waste, right? This mm -hmm. was a person who's, they take a biopsy to figure out what's going on with them, uh, discover that they have, you know, an ovarian cancer, but those cells were then, they tried mm -hmm. to use them. And so the question of the book is, number one, which we already know now, you have to get consent. Absolutely. You don't take anything. Even no. when we take samples that are biological waste, we get consent. The consent. surgeon consents the patient yep. beforehand. We have no identifying data. Nope. So that we all we, we get know an ID is ID code and that's that's it. right. We don't know anything about the person. And then there's this idea of if people have made millions off of tissue culture, that is the person's self are, is that person's um, uh, family entitled mm -hmm. to that? And these are all really important questions. Um, I, and I remember because we utilized uh, uh, cell lines to test the safety of the coronavirus vaccine. Mm -hmm. Get very topical and very mm -hmm. you know current event. And I remember my brother said, "You tell me about these cells that were used." And I'm like, "What do you want to know?" Yeah, you know, it's like a lot of tissue culture is done off of cells that have just been obtained. Right. You know, when they were obtained, there wasn't consent rules or regulations right. at the That's time. Right. What do you want me to tell you? He's like, was this taken from a child? And I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. I'm like, you're asking me about a cell line that derived during a period of time where records really That's weren't right. good. Yeah. So it could have been right. from a child. It could have been from, you know, a, uh, a juvenile yeah. or it could have been. Well, there was been... no consensus, concept of HIPAA and patient yeah. rights. In 1940-something, 1950-something. And the term... Hello, we made an atomic bomb. Right. 
And also, at the same time, this is what I said to my brother, where do you draw the line at juvenile? Right. And he looked at me and he went, well, well, what do you mean? I said, well, technically, in science, as soon as the child can breathe on its own, it's a juvenile. Right. It's no longer an infant, it's a juvenile. That's right. Infants can't take care of themselves in any way, shape, or form in terms of their life support. Juveniles can. Right. So, tell me. Well, you know, that's, <laughs> there's so many pitfalls yeah. and issues with where you get your samples from. Exactly. exactly. That's why I, well, I personally like to work with primary cells mm-hmm. right out of the tissue because they're closest to the in yep. vivo situation, right? Yeah. They're closest to the organ that mm-hmm. they came from. Um, but also, then we can get consent and we don't have to worry. And so you have that sort of approach as well. Let me ask you this, especially for your work. Uh, the advances now, I know this because ever since I was a student, this topic has come up like a hundred times. 3D cell culture. That's We've right. yeah. all heard it over and over. It's kind of like the white whale of science. Right. Bioprinting yeah. is now becoming more and more of a thing, which... For people that don't know, uh, when we talk about tissue culture, we're talking a two-dimensional plane, which means we have a layer, and then there's cells that grow, and that's it. Well, in your body, you're not just a flat piece of paper. You have multiple layers. There's a lot more uh, complications in that. 3D cell culture is supposedly supposed to take care of that, but a lot of times... uh, Oxygen diffusion doesn't work in those right. models. But. So I actually do 3D cell culture with the chondrocytes, mm-hmm. but the chondrocytes like to be at low oxygen. <laughs> yes. So it works very well for mm-hmm. them. They don't like a lot of oxygen. That's yeah. the way it looks in the in vivo. So we do. We have them suspended in out. Al- it's something called alginate. It's like a gel. Okay, yeah. I was going to um, ask, did you do hanging drop or did you yeah, do alginate? Yeah, we drip beat? them. Yeah, we, yep, they're, they're dropped. So it's a... It's a, it's a uh, Alginate's a polymer mm-hmm. that starts out as a liquid, yep. and we put the cells in, and then when they when they uh, reach, um, we drop them into calcium. Yep. The calcium forms a, a polymer, polymer yep. and so they bead up. Mm-hmm. Um, and but but those are cells that like in the center. They like that hypoxia. It's called that low yeah. oxygen. Well, for us, it's hypoxia. For them, it's normal. It's normal. Yeah, exactly. Because that's, remember, that's no the blood flow. Part. So that's they're not the funniest getting, part yeah. about uh, these things is that um, a lot of cell culture is done at a level of, level of oxygen that most of these cell types never experience not, not at all. Saying, yeah. And, you know, that's, again, this is why we call it modeling and That's not, right. ex- you know, a one-to-one representation. Right. It's in model situations, it flows like this. Yeah. I, I actually had a student um, that I was discussing statistics with, and I said, here's how you're going to phrase it, which is going to save you a lot of scrutiny that will come back to, co- to come at you. Given current data set, <laughs> we can make this claim. That's a good phrase. It's a wonderful Given the current data given set. Given current data set. <laughs> and he's like, but I said, no, no. This is all the statement that you can make. That's all you're saying. That's right. It's given my current data That's set, right. this is all I can say. That's all you can say. Yeah. Um, but given the current changes, I mean, uh, one of the, I have to talk to you probably later about a new technique, which is actually utilizing just a shaker plate to develop the bead instead yeah. of actually using the outlet. And yeah. the way the drop, it doesn't create a uniform distribution of the cells. You'll get clumping. Right. This, in terms of the shaking, supposedly forms more of a oh, uniform distribution nice. of the cells. Yeah. So we'll have to, we'll have yeah, to talk, we'll talk about, about that. Yeah, we'll talk about that, yeah. Yeah, so... That again, that's all about your experimental design, though. Yep. You know, you you have to know what you're trying to recreate. I mm-hmm. mean, everything we do in vitro is modeling what's happening in the body, yep. right? We're trying to model it. Um, there's organ cultures. There's different ways of doing it, but depending on the cells that you're looking at, you can get away with it. We even did some co-cultures a few years back where we had those beads. So we had cells in a mono layer that were attached in that 2D, mm-hmm. um, and they, those were osteoblasts that like to be spread out, right? Yeah. They like to be attached like that. Then we put a little cup in that has a fil- filter on the end, and we add the beads above. So now you create that interaction between yep. the cartilage and the bone that underlies it in your normal 
growth plate, you know, of the bones, of the long bones. And then we look to see what would happen. How do they talk to each other? How do they behave? Again, you know, utilizing those different elements. So that's where the creativity that we've been talking about comes mm-hmm. in. You know, you think about it. That was an idea we had. I had with a student that I had. They were like, oh, maybe we could do this. And I said, oh, I've heard of this. Let me yep. find it. You know, and then we made it work. Um, and that whole 3D culture that I did, that's what is my postdoc project. Mm-hmm. I came in, I said I needed to be completely serum free. So there's, when you do cell culture, you add serum, yep. which is basically part of a, a, an undisclosed blood component. Yeah. But uh, it has all kinds of good stuff in it, like growth factors. You really don't want to discuss what that thing is yeah, made of. <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, you we those who had figured out tissue culture realized that you needed to add these elements to help the cells. It's Correct. the fries to your burger. And That's right. It's, it makes the meal complete. That's you know, right. My, uh, so the cells are happy. Yes. Well, what, what was it? One professor likened it to supersizing. <laughs> you're, you want to make it the complete meal. That's Supersize right. it. Supersize it. You, know, you want to make sure that you've got it all there. But the problem for when I started graduate school, the question I was asking, I wanted to look at that growth factor, mm-hmm. and I wanted to look at those enzymes, and they are in serum yep. and they are in there in undisclosed amounts nobody yep. knows nobody's gonna well, and we it, can. you don't know right and it's different you know each time each batch of serum is slightly different mm-hmm. so then i said well how can i you know ask this question yep. how can i test this and that's when i came up i saw some papers on doing this 3d and i perfected it for myself and so you have this now recreating the in vivo three-dimensional cartilage but I could go completely serum free because the density of the cells, they were able to talk to each other. They made the matrix they needed and they were happy. So now I'm serum free. I'm just giving them the amino acids they need to live. Yep. Minimal and then, essential media. Exactly. <laughs> and then I can take that and say anything that's in that media, they made. Yep. So now I'm studying anything I want to treat them with, I add to the mm-hmm. media. And so now it's again that Virgo control. Now I'm controlling it. So, you know, you do what you got to do. You yeah. do what you got to do to make it work. And um, sometimes it's really cool and sometimes it's a total bust. It doesn't work the way you thought. Yeah, but then that, that also just makes it that more fun because you have to figure out why the puzzle didn't exactly. fit correctly. You exactly. know, it's like, well, I've got one, two, it's the, the Ikea thing. Why do I have all these extra parts? <laughs> I've got too many bolts. <laughs> I have too many extra bolts. Why do I have too many extra bolts? <laughs> yeah. Yep, the extra bolts of science. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, one of the questions that I normally ask um, is, how has things changed since you started? But we've been we've, we've talked about we've that. kind of been hitting that one yeah. repeatedly. I mean, because I have seen major changes. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's been my career has spanned a very exciting time in sci- in bio biomedical science. Yes, and so I've seen huge changes occur. Um, that have really impacted our day-to-day experimentation. Um, but yeah, we've talked about many of them mm-hmm. already, yeah. And actually one of our audience members just echoed a fact that we said earlier, which he says, uh, or excuse me, they say, uh, I know in engineering you learn more from a fail than a success. And that's that's, that's the right. truth. That's correct. You know, um, one, of the, one of the things that's beautiful about failure is, is uh, one, one professor of mine said, if you don't know how to do it the right way, do it the wrong way. You'll figure out the right way very quickly. <laughs> it's so true. It's, it's true. so true, yeah. It really is. I mean, troubleshooting is always, for me, troubleshooting is frustrating, but it's also the most exciting part of doing the experiment mm-hmm. because you can rule out why it didn't work, right? Yeah. You can say like, okay, this, 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 therefore, if all of these things, nothing's wrong with any of the way we set up the experiment, none of the lots of reagents we use, everything's yep. good, then we're asking the wrong question. Mm-hmm. Start again. Yeah. You know? I mean, um, that's, that's kind of the beauty of the human condition because we, we as human, I don't think many, uh, and I think it's probably the best term is to simply say laymen or lay women, lay people. Lay people. Lay people. Um, he, the human body lives on a fine line of homeostasis. Yes. And pe- I, I don't think anyone really understands, yeah. except for scientists and certain doctors, just how fine of a line yes. that really is. We take so much for granted. Yes. 
about how the body works. Mm -hmm. um, well, it just is, right? Yeah. My heart is just <laughs> going to beat. Well, I'm just going to eat that, and it's going to digest. It just is, isn't it? You know, and it's... Well, uh, my, we talked about my wife earlier. She had her gallbladder removed. She had to change the way she ate That's because right. the gallbladder is yeah. involved in fat and That's lipid right. digestion. Right. So she had to stop eating certain things that That's were right. heavy yep. in fat and lipids. That's right. You know, yep. certain things that you don't even realize come into play out of nowhere. That's right. You know, uh, we if I'm not mistaken, we still don't know why... Uh, if you are a white Ameri American or, excuse me, Western woman, you will have to have your gallbladder taken out, period, Yeah. at a certain point. Yes, it's, it's, the, um, <laughs> uh, it's the, the three Fs, fat female and 40, mm -hmm. over 40, yeah, that's the most gallbladder problems. Well, it's like males. If, um, if a human male lives long enough, he will get testicular cancer. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. You know, I talk about that with my students all the time about osteoporosis because mm -hmm. osteoporosis is another bone disease, yeah. right? Um, which I don't really study that because I'm more focused on the cartilage. But, you know, I, I understand and, and do a lot of thinking about the hormones and what affects them. And we know that women would go into menopause, yep. the estrogen drops, osteoporosis is an issue because it's part of that mm -hmm. arc that keeps the calcium storage in your bones. Yep. But what we've found with the increasing average lifespan is that we now see high percentages of osteoporosis in older men yep. as well because they're living longer yeah. and it's time for, they get to the point where there's a certain, like you said, there's estrogen in men and te testosterone yep. in women. We've now seen that that is going up because mm -hmm. of the hormones dropping with age and now men are getting osteoporosis yep. so you know there's there's always like there was theoretically it was true before but now we have evidence right. because men are living long enough mm -hmm. right so now we can see it no, and diagnose right. it i mean that's that's one of the things that a lot of people don't realize i, I was talking with my mother recently because um uh you know i Mental health is a completely separate conversation that we can have at a completely separate time. <laughs> but, you know, my mother didn't realize that some of the things that she was going through and what her family was going through are now affecting my brother and I. Yeah. It's like I looked at my mother and I'm like, I, I, well, I was prescribed this and this. Oh, I've been on that. Yeah, exactly. Why didn't you tell me Why that? didn't you mention it? And she went, oh, well, it wasn't that big of a deal. No, that is a big deal, mother. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, getting getting uh, my mother, who's from that generation, she was born in the in the 50s, you know, you don't talk about those things. That's you don't right. talk about family medical That's history. Right. That's, That's right. not something you talk about yeah. outside the family. The kids don't know what mom and dad have. Yeah. Right. And it's like now we're starting to understand that a lot of these things that we didn't think were predispositions are now predispositions. Um, what is it? Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease yes. is one of the most common uprising disorders in all Western cultures. Yes. We don't know why, no. but it is. Yeah. You know, that, that's, uh, that's one of, the th one of uh, my community was mentioning to me, what does elevated you know, liver enzymes mean? And I'm like, I mean, it's one of three things. I mean, you're looking at either cirrhosis, uh, fatty liver disease or not alcoholic fatty liver disease. I mean, I did, yeah. you're asking me to narrow something down right. to, you know, something major. But again, that fine line. Of That's right. That's right. That's right. And, you know, we as scientists are trying to, like, figure out how far you can teeter off of that line before it completely snaps. That's right. <laughs> it's kind of fun. I, you know, I, yeah, we, we talked about the culture shock that I have with my family a lot. And I remember I was doing my first independent research project in undergrad. And someone asked me what I was doing. And I remember it was Thanksgiving. And I started talking about it and just rambling off. And I was, you know, cutting up my next bite. And I noticed something. You want to know what I noticed? Oh, uh, what? Silence. Oh. Everyone uh, had uh. stopped. Uh. And I looked up and I went... Did you spoil their appetite um, with your conversation? No, I was... I was looking at the relationship between uh, the oxygen carrying proteins, oh, okay. and I went, "Okay, where did I lose everyone?" Because <laughs> you lost them. Because, uh, and you know, Dr. Balin and I discussed this earlier, but we have our own language yeah. that we speak. Yeah. Um, there was an old movie, and forgive me, I forget what the name was. My father loved watching movies from uh, the the '40s all the way up to present day. 
but there was a, a movie where a uh, a priest went to speak to someone who um, was a failed priest. Okay. And they both spoke Latin, and that was their common language. Ah. They could actually speak to each other, even though they were. I think one was Portuguese and the other was English. But they could speak. To but each they other could in speak Latin. to each other in Latin, and it was so interesting. Oh well, here we go. Here's something. Uh, I worked on data from nuclear power stations. We were trying to work out what caused the rate uh, the boilers uh, fired up. We had 40 years of data from 16 reactors. There were only 22 variables. We could not find the cause. <laughs> I don't even want to consider the number of variables that we deal with. The, the weird part is, is that I think it's hubris. We all think that we know all of the variables, and then one variable or three variables comes in That's right. and just takes a baseball bat to your yep. to your theory. So yeah. you're not wrong. No, <laughs> no and, wrong. and that, again, that's the perspective, the way you look at the data. Yeah. You have to you have to believe the numbers. Mm-hmm. The numbers do not lie, and so if the yeah. numbers are not doing what you think they were going to mm-hmm. do, then you have to change the way you're looking at it. Yeah. You have to ask the question differently. And you know, one of the projects we're doing right now, the the lung project, mm-hmm. uh, we had been trying to inhibit one of these enzymes and looking at collagen production because remember fibrosis can. Yep. Um, and we kept, you know, we it was kind of working, but it wasn't really convincing. Yeah. And then we were doing some reading. We said, oh, why don't we look at this element? So we're going to look at the collagen, but we're also going to look at the elastin mm. and see what happens. And bam, whole different story. So when you looked at the two together, yep. you suddenly now could see, oh, yeah, it's working. The elastin degradation is going down and the collagen degradation is going, is, is going up, which you mm. wanted to do because you don't want a scar. Yes. Right. So, but they, they needed to be looked at together to say that it is working in a positive way. Uh, and until we did that, we were just kind of like, man, this data is not doing, I don't understand it. It's weird. What's going on? There you know? is, because I'm, I'm very big about educating younger people in terms of biology and science as early as possible. Because, again, like I said, I believe anyone can come up with some kind of theory. There is a, um, a show that is out of Japan that's called Cells at Work. Mm. And it personifies very specific cells. So there's a personification of a white cell, a a red (laughs) blood cell. They even get into how thin the space is of a capillary because this person's trying, the red blood cell they have trying to go through is trying to, they're they're basically, they use the red blood cell as a package delivery system. Mm -hmm. And she's literally holding a box as she's squeezing through, and this guy opens (laughs) his door (laughs) and she's like, here you go. I love that. What's it called again? Cells at Work. Cells at Work. I believe it's on Netflix that. still. I have but to check that honestly, out. It, I had I, I told I was talking with Dr. Adams about this because they go into I believe it's uh, I believe it's the basophil, which we still have no idea how the basophil right. is right. in involved it's like, in. It's like a horrible immunology. thing. Why do we have it? Right. It makes you have anaphylactic shock. Right. Why do we have a basophil? And they <laughs> they were going over. I think it was food poisoning. And the basophil is sitting in the stomach, and he's just he's. He's a guy that's completely shrouded in everything. You know, you can only see his eyes. And he's just spouting off some philosophical nonsense. <laughs> and my wife and I, we were watching this, and she's like, and I'm dying. And she's like, why are you dying? I'm like, because we have no idea what it does. And they're all sitting there like, well, what is this guy doing here? He's just here. He's a troublemaker. That's We funny. know he's involved in the immunological process in some way. Yeah. We just don't know how. That's brilliant. I love it. I you love know, well, you know I love anything Japanese and anything any personification of they the cells. They actually go into hemorrhagic shock. Oh, yeah, it's it's nice. really interesting. Some of the things that they actually get into. That's fun. You know, and what I really like is that they actually have a voiceover that kind of does an aside every once in a while and explains yeah. what's going on. Yeah, and oh, it's, it's really cool. And they I they also have I think they actually have um, it's I forget what they are. Um, it's platelets. I have these platelets walking around, and they're the ones doing all the construction, but they're tiny little kids <laughs> because they're smaller than everything yeah. else. The and bits, they actually the pieces, have, they're pieces. They actually have collagen factors that Ooh, they put onto nice. 
onto scaffolds. That's right. Because when they that's are a scaffold, because clo- they close off wounds yeah. in one that's episode, right. That's right. and they literally just show like this conglomeration of uh-huh. cells that they grab. Very like, cool. It's really cool. Sounds. Like I have to fun. recommend it to you, one hundred percent. It's for kids, but again. Yeah, but I love that stuff. Yeah, yeah. it's it's exp- again. I I. You, I, I like to say that you kind of have to explain things in different ways. And I still remember this. My uh, professor, the first professor I had in bioinformatics, she had a bioinformatics for dummies book. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I came from a time period. I don't know if it's still the thing, but when you were an undergrad, the PhD knew everything. Right. You do not challenge the yeah, PhD. Yeah. They know everything. Know and I'm like, well, why do you have a bioinformatics for dummies? And she went... Well, I learned bioinformatics at the graduate level. You're an undergraduate. That's right. I have to be able to speak your language. That's right. That's right. And it's like, oh, yeah. I never really thought of it like that. She has to dumb it down for you. <laughs> well, she didn't think. She again. Yeah, just I, I don't know if I, I think of it that way. That's one of the reasons why I, I like those books, the yeah. For Dummies series yeah, yeah, and the yeah. I, I, the Idiot's Guide books. Yeah. Because they're speaking it in plain, they right. remove the jargon. Do you, you know, as a scientist, mm-hmm. you know how hard it is to write at that, like yep. the layperson's level. Whenever you do a grant, you have to write the statement that's going to be for the layperson. Scientific person. writers are yeah. now a thing. I mean, it's impo- It's sometimes it's so impossible. You know, you use the the grammarly or the word mm-hmm. function where it says whether what level education level it is. Some of the words you just have to use them, yep. right? There's no substitute for this topic, yep. but by using that word, it makes it a level that you can't, you know. First so time, it's very hard. It's very first hard. First time I butted heads with words in Bill, uh, a spell checker was when I was doing a uh, research paper on cystic fibrosis. Oh, it didn't like that, huh? Oh my God, it hated everything. It kept underlining cystic fibrosis. It kept underlining cystic fibrosis, it kept underlining (laughs) fibrosis, inflammation, malflammation. Yeah, Yeah, they didn't like any of that. uh, Well, I always say, you know, the Grammarly goes with the email now. Mm -hmm. So I love it for so many reasons. And one of the things that I find very entertaining about it is that once a week you get your report. And yeah. I always have 98%. I use more um, uh, more original vocabulary than 98% of Grammarly users. I'm like, well, that's because all I got to do is put a science word yep. in there and I'm good. You know, I, I, so I, I enjoy that. to some people that Grammarly makes it so that I sound more like a human being rather than a robot. Well, that's the other thing. They got the little icons <laughs> in the bottom on the bottom so you see what tone yep. your email is and then I go in and I keep changing it till I get the tone I want yep. and then I hit send. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's true. Oh, I don't want formal. I don't want formal. I don't want angry. I don't want aggressive. I'm yep. going to keep changing it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. Um, we could go all night. We could. We could go all night. We could. I mean, it's, it, I, I'm glad that it's not as rare as it was when I was a student to be excited about science. Yes. You know, that's that's one of the things that unfortunately is, a, is an aspect because you meet all types when you're a student. Yep. And unfortunately, the majority of people are way too focused on their end point to understand that you don't need to be all yeah, business. That's right. I have to say I had very good mentors through my mm. career um, that made a difference. You know, people who were yeah. very excited about science and had a very healthy work-life balance that mm. made it more enticing for me. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's something we strive for um, moving forward, like trying to give that excitement to the students that I train and all. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, I agree with you. I could talk about it forever. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's that's one of the things. It's like I get excited about some of the dumbest things, but it's like it's so cool. Let's it's keep so talking cool. about it. And my favorite podcasts are the ones about things that I really don't understand, mm-hmm. but I just love to listen to hearing to hear them talk about, you know, that it's always physics because physics is just – you know, one of those things that I always am like, I kind of get what you're saying, but... May I recommend yeah. uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson's That's the one that I, I listen to that Astrophysics for people in a hurry. Yes, I listen to that all the time. But I, I have to say that, um, you know, that, that idea of just listening to science, mm-hmm. you know, uh, listening to, to reading books about 
discoveries that are not in the field, yeah. you know, science adjacent from what I do. Right. It's still exciting. I mean, yeah. that's just exciting is the word. It's just it is what it is. No, you're 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 absolutely right. I mean, that's um, that's what gets me to keep going. It's I, I said to my wife the other day. I'm like because my social battery was dead. I was like, I have to summon. <laughs> All the willpower I have to get in. And there was a brand new article that was actually about uh, hydrogel and hydrogel. Oh. Bioprinting. Yeah. 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 Bioprinting is so a Very, cool. very interesting. Oh my God, topic. we could talk a whole time uh-huh. topic about that. Uh-huh. And, and that meat that they made Did in I the tell lab. You? There's there's currently, and this is probably something that our audience doesn't know about, but there's, there's a lab that's currently working... In Europe, because I was a part of a conference and I got to s- listen to them talk, they actually got epithelial cells to form true pyramidal, true palisade. Oh. Literally the soldiers standing up yeah, in a row. Yeah. And they got true gap junctions and liparafts to oh. form. In 3D printing? 3D cell culture. Oh, 3D cell they culture. They didn't okay. have to create Woo. a matrix I you said or printing. anything. They got them to do it. But here, and you know, I know that this is a topic that people probably have no idea. They also got true apical and true basal yes, formation. Yes, which is critical for epithelium. Yeah. Absolutely critical. Yeah. They didn't do anything to it. Yeah. They just added straight media to the top. But it was about the, the way the cells were uh, in Aligned. the formation. Yep, and they had the they conformation. Even separate cells underneath, uh, and they actually looked at how different they formed. For them to... It was so cool. I was like... But you know, because apical basal is just where you're talking, yep. right? I'm yep. talking to the outside world. I'm talking to the inside world. Yep. And so if you give it something to, I mean, theoretically, it makes sense. If you yep. give it a touchstone, you're it's right. going to be able to create that. Mm-hmm. But to give it the touchstone is the key, right? How do you do that? That's the one thing. Right. They just they just kept it going. Yeah. And I think their current culture is like 12 years old or something Really? Like that. Yeah. that is so cool. They've had it going a long oh, I'm time. I'm going to have to look this up. Yeah. I, I don't. Cool. I don't remember. Unfortunately, I didn't write down the yeah. the lab, but I don't think that they've published just uh, yet. Oh yeah, they're not ready. Yeah. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Well, anyway, it is six oh two. Okay, if we're um, done. We're uh, done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we could again. We could go all night. Probably didn't for the rest feel like of the it year. was that long. That I told was, this you. was super fun. I told you. I had a good time. So, um, I I like to open the floor up to you. Okay. Uh, any of our guests, I'd like to open up the floor. Tell us what's going on for. Dr. D'Angelo, or if there's anything that you want to say out to the to the audience, the floor is yours, Dr. D'Angelo. Oh, okay. Um, well, I just hope that I, this was entertaining for you. It was very fun for me to sit and talk with Joe this time. And, um, you know, I uh, I look forward to doing this again. Great. And I guess that if they, people have questions, they can send them to you. Absolutely. And, and I would love to answer them. So mm-hmm. they can. Yeah. Uh, you can submit your questions either in the comments below, if you're watching this on YouTube, or... Through my Discord channel, I actually have a special uh, topic in there for Science Talk. Yeah, excellent. Um, I enjoyed it immensely. Well, I want to give our audience any last uh, few moments to formulate any questions that they have. Are there any questions that you might have for me? I know I've been here kind of bombarding you with all questions and topics. No, I mean, this this was a nice format. I enjoyed Mm -hmm. it. It feels very... Um, next time I'm going to make us tea. <laughs> <laughs> what we need tea and tea? crumpets. What, ta- what we need kind tea of tea? and crumpets. Um, well, I personally am a chai tea person. Mm. And I also like some very good black or rooibos. Mm. Any of those I'll make for you. <laughs> oh, I have some wonderful uh, green tea that I actually... Mm. That's uh, good too. I buy it from a website that sources it directly from the Japanese growers. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Well, I think next time we have to have tea and crumpets. I think I think that's a great idea. Well, uh, Dr. D'Angelo, it looks like our audience is letting you off easy. Okay, great. Thank <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. You are always welcome back. So okay, if there's wonderful. any topic that you ever want to talk about, feel free to come, okay, great. come back and join us. All right. Now thank let me you. take us home and we'll all be able to go and enjoy dinner. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, we definitely had fun. I hope you guys did. Uh, If you enjoyed the stream, please give us a follow, as that is the best way to find out when we're going on. Also, don't forget to join our Discord, as that is the best way to be notified what the schedule is, and then you can uh, interact with us that way. Um, Also, uh, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, because that makes Google happy. Um, hmm, Is there anything else? Subscribe if you want to. You don't have to. Um, Yeah, links are going to be in the description below and on my Twitch homepage. So long, everybody. Thanks for all the fish. Good night.